So thank you very much for uh, inviting me. So many of you uh, refer your patients with dementia to people like our, our clinic uh, for workup and for further management. Um, and that's fine, uh, especially if you have limited exposure to the elderly and uh, little confidence in your abilities with, uh, with dementia. But an increasing number of you have full service practices with tons of geriatric patients um, and you've developed an int interest in, in dementia, and it may well be appropriate for you to start doing some of your own dementia workups and the dementia follow-up care. So in my experience, about half the dementia patients I see are in some way complex, uh, and I wouldn't suggest you tackle those, but about half of them are really quite stereotyped and, and, and quite uh, straightforward. Now, um, I prepared these slides for another talk that I'm doing in a couple of weeks, a longer talk for the family practice residents, so I will be skipping a variable number of the slides as we, as we go through. It's hard to find the back, so we can use that first. Okay. So I have no particular disclosures to, to make. So my uh, objectives for today then are these. Uh, first of all, how would you pick out the, the, the so-called low-hanging fruit? Uh, the, the, the straightforward, stereotyped sort of Alzheimer's patients from the more complex ones. Then how would you do a, a proper workup uh, if you're going to do that? And you, of course, are going to do it in stages. I, I have an hour and a half to do my workups, and you're probably going to have to spread it over a number of visits. And having diagnosed these patients with, with dementia, how are you going to do, do a follow-up program for them using chronic disease management principles? So I'm going to give you the case of Mrs. Uh, J. So Mrs. J. A 78-year-old lady in your practice presents on this occasion with her husband who expresses concerns regarding his wife's memory. She needs to be reminded of things often. She repeats herself frequently. She has forgotten her PIN number twice. And once she had trouble locating her car in the shopping mall parking lot. <laughs> that, so, I... Apparently, that, that, that's apparently called Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so her past medical history is rather benign. She's got mild hypertension and, and takes hydrochlorothiazide and ramipril. She has hy hypothyroidism and is on thyroxin. She's got osteoarthritis of the knees, and she averages about two Tylenol number threes per day for that. And she's also on oxazepam, 15 milligrams QHS, which you've not been able to get her off, and she's taken that for about 10 years, and then on vitamin D. You've done recent labs, and she's got a normal CBC, electrolytes, uh, kidney function, TSH, and glucose, and you may want to add a couple more items to that now uh, for her dementia workup. You had recently done a physical on, on her, and all was unremarkable. Her blood pressure was 142 over 68. You don't normally do much uh, neurology exam during, during those physicals, so you may need to go back and do that. And you have noticed that her gait is a little off, but probably the antalgic kind of gait that you see with people with painful knees rather than a CNS type of gait. Her clock, clock drawing test is abnormal, and it's, it's shown there. So thus far, everything to me is looking like standard Alzheimer's disease. So this would, to me, look like one of those low-hanging fruits. And this is the kind of lady I just love to see on a Friday afternoon. So where to start? Well, you have to know your landmarks. You have to know where the goalposts are. So as you start doing your workup with, with Mrs. J, presumably at the next visit, you've got to know that there are three possible outcomes to your workup. One is that there is no cognitive impairment, and we see those, people who are worried because they've got a family member with Alzheimer's disease. Or she might have dementia, or she might be in between the two, which would be mild cognitive impairment. So where are the goalposts? So all-cause dementia is defined as having deficits in two areas of cognition, um, and the candidates there are, for all intents and purposes, memory, speech, and executive functioning. Now, the official list has things like apraxia and agnosia, but these are things that happen late, late in the course of dementia, and you can just uh, tune those out. So looking for deficits in two areas of those three, and, and this is important, as a result, there must be some loss of independence in, in daily functioning. MCI, mild cognitive impairment, is a category, not a disease. So it's the category of all people who are 
not normal, but not so bad as to meet those criteria for dementia. And if you were to follow people with MCI over time, you would find that, that a small majority of them, perhaps 50 or 60 percent of them, would eventually just turn into Alzheimer's disease or, or another dementia. They're preclinical dementias. But a significant component of, the, of them have some other kind of illness, something else that's causing some cognitive change, such as, for instance, depression, anxiety, other mental illnesses, uh, psychoactive medications, uh, sleep apnea, hypothyroidism, et cetera, et cetera. So why is that important? Well, for MCI, uh, sorry, for dementia, you're going to disclose the fact that they have a progressive neurodegenerative disease, and you're going to consider giving them a cholinesterase inhibitor, whereas with the MCI patients, you're going to do a medical workup and try to correct whatever problems there might be. You're going to do follow-up uh, to see if they're turning into a dementia with time, and you're not going to use a cholinesterase inhibitor because they haven't been found effective in the setting of MCI. So here are some good questions that you might ask the Js when you see them, questions that might help elicit some of these, these uh, points. For instance, what mistakes have you or has she been making because of bad memory? So I'm looking for memory problems that have consequences. People come in all the time and they say, well, I go into the bedroom to get something and I get there and I can't remember what it was and I go back. Well, you know, all of us have done that too. So tell me about memory problems that have consequences to them. What activities uh, are you having difficulty with now? What tasks have you taken over from her because of this problem? And here's the acid test. If you had to leave her alone for a month, how would she do? So we're looking for evidence of disability. Okay. Uh, let's skip that. So let's go back to our next visit now with Mrs. J. And this is what we find out. Mrs. J says that she no longer enjoys social situations because she gets it in her mind to say something and then can't get the words to flow. So she's having some speech difficulty. She used to manage the family finances, but was making mistakes, and her husband has taken this over. So we're seeing executive function problems, but we're also seeing evidence of, of disability. Last Christmas, she had trouble putting together her usual baking from the recipes and had to get her daughter-in-law to help. So now from this history, we can see that she meets the criteria for a dementia. There's trouble with memory, there's trouble with executive functions, there's trouble with speech, and there's some loss of independence. So she meets those, those criteria. So which cognitive test should one do in general? There's the MOCA, there's the MMSE. Probably the MOCA is overused these days. The MOCA is the more difficult test. So if your history had indicated that the patient had mild cognitive impairment, that is to say some memory problems but no uh, disability, then I would do the MOCA, the more difficult test. But if the history, as in this case, suggests that there's a dementia, then I would do the MMSE and the clock drawing test. So here's Mrs. J's. Uh, MMSE. So we're not looking for a number. There's nothing in the, in the diagnostic criteria that says that a person with, has dementia because they have an MMSE score of such, or, uh, such and such. We're just looking for confirmation of what we've uh, learned from the history. So she scored 26 out of 30, but importantly, she lost two of those points on three-word recall, which is fairly significant. Remember these three words, apple, table, penny. Now spell world backwards. Now, what were those three words? So after about 15 seconds of distraction, she wasn't able to remember two of her, her three words. And here's her clock. And this is just the absolute typical clock of somebody with early Alzheimer's uh, disease. So it shows poor planning. So probably all of us in this room would have put on 12, 6, 3, 9, and filled in the numbers around it. But she, she just started numbering and, and, and uh, didn't space them out properly. And when we said, put the hands on the clock at 10 minutes past 11, Instead of making that abstract leap to, that's 11 and 2, she's gone very concretely to 10 and 11. OK. So there are standard lab tests that, that are suggested for all uh, dementia workups. Those are the ones on the left-hand side. Uh, and I think the ones that were missing from Mrs. J were the calcium and the B12. The ones on the right are ones you might do under special circumstances. Note, for instance, that syphilis serology is not among the standard uh, tests, and it's rarely ever done these days. Cranial imaging, theoretically, 
is not required in all cases. In fact, the clinical practice guidelines would say that Mrs. J does not need uh, cranial imaging done. I think in a family practice setting, it would probably be best if you just did uh, a, a CAT scan, a CT scan, on every patient that you see. It's not a big thing. Go ahead and do it. But having done it, don't be led astray by some of the things you're going to read on it. So, for instance, Mrs. J's uh, CT scan said, there is mild generalized atrophy. That means absolutely nothing. And it also said that there is some patchy areas of low attenuation in the subcortical white matter, most likely due to small vessel ischemia. This is also more properly known as leukoareosis. I wouldn't say this is totally benign, and it's probably aggravating or magnifying your Alzheimer's disease, but it should not lead you to make a diagnosis of vascular dementia just because it's there. Okay, so uh, subtyping of, of dementia, as you know, uh, the most common ones would be Alzheimer's disease, uh, Alzheimer's mixed with vascular, which is actually probably the most common because there's usually some sort of vascular contribution to a person's Alzheimer's disease. There's vascular dementia, which is terribly overdiagnosed. It's actually one of the, the more rare dementias, about 5 to 10 percent max of, of, of dementias. And to make the diagnosis of vascular dementia, you have to have a, a strict temporal association between stroke and cognitive change. You've got dementia with Lewy bodies. You've got Parkinson's disease dementia. So those five dementias there would make up more than 90 percent of all the dementias. But significantly, they're all progressive diseases with about the same prognosis, and they can all be treated with a cholinesterase inhibitor. So it wouldn't be any great mistake if one misclassified within that, that group. Not so perhaps with normal pressure hydrocephalus, um, but if you have done a CAT scan on every patient, you're not gonna get caught out with, with NPH. Um, now, of course, you may overdiagnose it because radiologists have a hard time telling enlarged ventricles due to atrophy from enlarged ventricles due to obstruction. So probably of all the, the ones where the radiologist says maybe NPH, maybe one in 10 actually will be. Uh, but at least you're gonna send those possible ones off to a, to a specialist of some sort. Frontotemporal dementia, uh, you should not try to diagnose. Um, I probably, I, I rarely ever see it. Uh, maybe once every three years I see a frontotemporal dementia. Because, first of all, these are younger patients. They're usually in their 40s or 50s. They don't have memory problems as a rule, at least to, at, the, at the beginning. And they present with very bizarre behaviors that will nearly always end them up with a, with a psychiatrist before they see a geriatrician. And you don't treat uh, frontotemporal uh, dementia with a uh, cholinesterase inhibitor. So Mrs. J has quite typical Alzheimer's disease. She's in that older age group, 78. There was a gradual onset, insidious progression. There's been loss of, of memory, speech, and executive function, but most of all, loss of memory. That should be the leading uh, complaint at any rate. She's got a normal CNS exam, including gait, um, and she's got a benign CT scan. So these things really point quite strongly towards a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And this is the kind of patient that if you're going to get into the, the business of working up dementia, this is a, a good patient to, to, to start with. Reasons to refer, well, um, age under 65, the, the, the prevalence of dementia at age 65 is about 1%, so it's quite a rarity at age 65, so you wouldn't want to, to feel comfortable diagnosing it in, in a younger patient. Progression that seems too rapid, too much fluctuation, memory loss not being the predominant feature, an excess of, of depression, hallucinations, delusions, and behavioral issues, an unexplained abnormality of gait, because in Alzheimer's disease, the CNS exam and the gait should be pristinely normal, abnormal CNS exam, confusing comorbidities. By that, I would mean something like, say, temporal arteritis that, that could, be a, could cause a vasculitis. And if you're just not sure about whether you should use a cholinesterase inhibitor in a given patient or not, that might be a reason for referral. Or if you don't feel confident in doing the, in doing the follow-up care, because if you're buying into the point of doing a dementia assessment, you've got to buy into the point of doing the follow-up care as well. So would you get caught by depression? Probably not. Um, many patients who present with, with uh, dementia are 
depressed. It, it's a common comorbidity. But you won't very often run into a patient who has depression as the one and only cause of their, of their cognitive deficits, so-called so pseudo-dementia. It's rare. And it's usually pretty obvious because the patient usually has rather gross psychomotor retardation. What about delirium? Again, hopefully you wouldn't make that, that mistake. The history in Mrs. J was progressive cognitive impairment over six to 12 months. Uh, delirium, the history should be confused since last Tuesday. Okay, the next step, diagnostic disclosure. So this is an important time, and I think probably deserves a visit on its own. So we've probably done that last visit, and now maybe after the CAT scan has come back, we've had them come back, family present, in order to do the, the diagnostic disclosure. So I would, sensitively I hope, tell them about the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and, and roughly what to expect. I would back that up with some written literature, and if you want to see the handout that I've made uh, to use at the time of disclosure. I'm happy to send that to you. I'll give, my, give you my e email address. I would make a referral to the Alzheimer's Society for further education and counseling. Now, many parts of the province now have what's called the First Link Program for the Alzheimer's Society. It's not everywhere, but it's in most of the province now. And in First Link, you make a referral directly to the Alzheimer's Society. They contact the patient and family and then they essentially case manage them for the rest of, of the journey, the Alzheimer journey. So they stay with them after, after that. Uh, and then arrange the next uh, appointment because the important message to give these people is not, you know, you've got Alzheimer's disease, bye bye, uh, but this is a, the beginning of a journey that you and I are gonna take together and I'm gonna be here to help you with it. Okay. What about dementia drugs, the cholinesterase inhibitors? Well. I think probably people like the, the therapeutics initiative would say, oh, these drugs don't work. Well, they, it's true, they have limited efficacy. They have a small benefit, but that small benefit may be quite useful in, in selected patients. I probably put about 60% of my, my new diagnoses on a uh, cholinesterase inhibitor now, down from about 90, say, 10 years ago. Memantine, I think you could basically forget memantine. It's only indicated in, in late stages of, of dementia at a time when you don't really have any interest in, in trying to improve their, their cognition after they've lost all their independence. So I think you could just basically tune out the memantine and work with the cholinesterase inhibitors. In the 40% where I don't I use a cholinesterase inhibitor, uh, half of those roughly would be because of, of contraindications. And the other half would be just because I've, I've decided that there's just too little to be gained by one of these drugs with, with small benefits. So the patient has too many other illnesses. And even if I could improve their cognition by 10%, would it make any difference in the greater scheme of things? And on the, the contraindication side, the two most important contraindications, the, one that you should, the ones you should always look for, would be bradycardias and conduction problems or a history of syncope. Because these drugs, after all, being um, cholinergic, so they're the exact opposite of, of atropine, they're vagotonic. Uh, if you have a bradycardia already, it can push you over the edge. And there certainly is a, a documented increase in the rate of, of pacemaker insertion on, on patients receiving these drugs. But to be clear, they won't have any effect on a normal heart. The other contraindication to worry about is asthma or uh, COPD. So again, they're cholinergic drugs. They're the exact opposite of atrovent. They may make your airways uh, twitchy. Uh, won't affect a normal lung, but could push you over the edge if you have asthma or bad COPD. Okay. There are three of these drugs, and I think you know that. Uh, there's denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. Two of them come as a pill. One of them comes as a, as a patch. The efficacy of them is all exactly the same. That's not an issue. So really, it comes out down to, do you want a pill or do you want a patch? Normally, I would uh, tend to start with a pill, just because often they have a, a blister pack, and so it's just a matter of slipping another pill into their, their blister pack. They don't have to remember another medication system to do. If they get stomach upset, nausea, vomiting, as about 15% of people will with a cholinesterase inhibitor, then I'd probably try the patch as, as my second uh, line. Titrate the dose up to the optimal level. You always start at a lower dose, but don't leave it at the lower dose. Bump the dose up after a month. Okay, 
So here's an important point. If a cholinesterase inhibitor is all the treatment you have to offer, quit now. I mean, they aren't terribly effective drugs. It's really much more of the non-pharmacological management of the, of the dementia that's going to make the difference. Things like ensuring patient safety if the patient is living alone, supporting the caregivers, and taking a, a CDM-type approach to, to follow-up care. I'm going to skip through a few of these slides. We've got about um, eight minutes. Okay, thank you. So let's go back to Mrs. J. So First Link contacts them, and they attended the Shaping the Journey series of lectures. They both later joined support groups. They attend the Minds in Motion exercise groups together. You prescribe Denepacil 5 milligrams, then 10 milligrams daily, and it is tolerated. You put the J's on a register of dementia patients and recall them for dedicated dementia visits every six months. Mrs. J voluntarily gives up driving at the time of diagnosis. Had she not, you would have administered the SAMARD test, and depending on the results, she might have gone on to do the drive-able examination. She continued to walk the dog, but on one occasion when the street was blocked uh, for paving, she got lost, so you got the safely home bracelet for her through the Alzheimer's Society. She needed minimal supervision at first, at the time of diagnosis, gradually more and more, and then after two years, Mr. J was no longer comfortable leaving her alone at home. And this is a bit of a watershed moment for folks with, with Alzheimer's disease, when the caregiver's stress will really uh, mount when they can no longer uh, leave them alone. So you made a home health referral, and they, set, they put in a respite worker who comes in for half a day a week so that Mr. J can go out. And they also enrolled her in an adult day program. About two and a half years from diagnosis, BPSD began to emerge, Behavioral and Psychological Symptoms of Dementia, BPSD. So BPSD began to emerge, as it often does in this sort of uh, moderately severe stage of the dementia, in the form of agitation and some delusions. She often believed that her husband was someone other than her husband. The agitation improved with some acetaminophen, which presumably uh, was helping her knee pain because it sort of acts like a burr under your saddle when you've got chronic pain from somewhere. So it's something we'll sometimes try. And with s citalopram The delusions themselves were not sufficiently distressing to require an antipsychotic agent. And we generally try to avoid using antipsychotics like quetiapine. So you'll often find that a drug like citalopram or s citalopram will be just as good for reducing agitation, not psychosis, but agitation in Alzheimer's patients. Uh, attendance at the adult day program was increased to three days per week because the level of caregiver stress was, was mounting. The home uh, health case manager discussed facility uh, placement with Mr. J, but he declined at, at that time. So at the three-year mark, she fell at home and broke her hip. She did not ambulate again and required placement from hospital. She settled into the facility quite well, and staff found that they could manage her agitation through appropriate caregiving strategies. Her MMSE was now below 10, the level at which you cannot get special authority for, uh, for the, co the cholinesterase inhibitor, and she was trialed off the denepacil. The BPSD didn't worsen, and it was definitively stopped. So let's just talk a bit about a CDM-type approach to dementia. So like other CDM programs, like uh, diabetes, for instance, you should ideally have a register of patients. And you should call them in at a certain intervals, let's say every six months, for a dedicated dementia visit, a dementia-only uh, visit. You should ideally have your care directed by a flow sheet. And we have made a flow sheet, and I'll give you the link to, to get it online. It's, it's digitally fillable. When I do follow-up visits on, on dementia, I look at five areas. I look at the medical status and the medication uh, list, uh, looking for things like um, anticholinergic drugs. It just doesn't make any sense to be treating a person with a cholinergic drug and an anticholinergic drug at the same time. And in the case of Mrs. J, you'd certainly want to get her off the oxazepam. Look at changes in cognition uh, and do the MMSE. Ask about changes in function. That's what's important. Um, ask about the BPSD status, if any, and ask how the, how the uh, caregiver is doing. So those are the five areas that I like to cover during the course of, of a, a a dedicated dementia visit. 
since you'll probably have to uh, do your dementia assessment spread out over a number of, of uh, visits, uh, you can use a number of, of uh, billing items to cover this, to, to, to bulk up your, your billing a bit. So for instance, you can use the, the 0101 and the 0120, of course, but also there's the community patient conferencing fee and the mental health planning fee that can be used. So here's a link to the flow sheet uh, that we've developed for dementia. There's my email address so that if you want to get my handout for diagnostic disclosure, you can do that. Uh, first link referral forms are, are available on the Alzheimer's uh, website. So to summarize the key points, the diagnosis of dementia is defined by a loss of cognition in two areas, usually memory, speech, executive function, together with some loss of independence in function. A dementia that is gradual and insidious in onset and affects memory predominantly is highly likely to be Alzheimer's disease or AD mixed with another dementia, or a dementia that is treated like AD, such as, as uh, dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease dementia. Run a standard panel of laboratory tests on all patients. Order CT brain scans on, on most patients. Refer patients to a dementia specialist if they have any alarm features or if the diagnosis is unclear. I won't go through the examples again. Disclose the diagnosis and backup disclosure with handout material. Refer to the Alzheimer's Society for education and support. Cholinesterase inhibitors have a modest benefit and are probably indicated in about 60% of cases. Major contraindications include airways disease, bradycardia, and seizure disorders. Provide follow-up care using CDM techniques, including registry, dedicated visits, flow sheet care, et cetera. And know your local resources, such as those available through home health, day centers, meal services, respite care, private agencies, et cetera. So I'll leave it there and take questions now. Thank you very much. Um,